All right, my country, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I call it to your time, Zoom. Ladies and gentlemen, you guys have come back to MC Potoski Talk Show here yeah, on YouTube, where you get the latest news and entertainment around the world. If it's your first time on this great platform where we react to all videos that comes our way, please consider to subscribe and Put on your thumb bell, and if you love what we do on this great platform, why don't you give us a thumbs up and also share this video? I appreciate all my subscribers. We got all my people. Bless you guys. And if you have anything to say about this video, you can also drop your comment at the comment section, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting more time, guys, let's dive into this video. Killed in previous days, many families were decimated. My immediate elder brother, this one following him, and the one of my cousins, three of them were killed. You need to know who my husband was. Harmless, no, couldn't harm, couldn't harm anybody. He liked life, he liked himself. He, liked, he was a, a lovely man. And he just knocked him off like that. was my favorite brother and he was outstanding as a, as a student. He was captain of cricket, captain of soccer. He was a sprinter. He was a sprinter and he was in the Nigerian 4 by 110 meters, 100 meters really team. So it was a, a great loss, you know, um, to the family. Um, of course, one tries to forgive. Leo Samuel Isiche, and he was a teacher, a darling father. He, you know, we looked up to him so much. He was everything to us, and he wanted to bring his children up to make sure that they had education. I want people to know because not many people know what happened. Even my own children, because God knows why I had to survive. For me to have a story to tell. And that's what I'm telling you now. For decades, the massacres at Asaba remained almost unknown outside the community. In 1967, the Nigerian press was tightly controlled, and few foreign news reporters were on the ground. In the words of Nobel laureate Wole Shoyinka, the Midwest Igbos had become the most vulnerable Nigerians. The war itself became internationally famous in 1968 after the federal government imposed a blockade, starving Biafra into submission in 1970. The silence began to lift in the mid-1990s, and some survivors testified to the 2001 Nigerian Human Rights Violations Investigation Commission, known as the Okuda Panel, which set the stage for more people to speak. It was for us the first opportunity uh, that we're going to have to even air the matter. But the, uh, the aim was really to begin something by way of the healing process. If you wrong somebody and the person has an opportunity to talk, to talk about it, and assuming you, you show an act, you show some confession, uh, you apologize, or you go some way into alleviating their, their pain and suffering, then the healing process can begin. Four decades after the war, Asaba is a busy state capital looking to the future. Yet the scars remain. 
these are visible in the derelict buildings that remain unrestored and on the bodies of those who survive. And they are invisible, borne by a sovereign who have kept the memory of the cruel deaths of their fathers, brothers, and uncles. The people of Asaba do not want retribution, only to tell their story, allowing the massacres to become part of Nigerian collective memory. After the war, the then head of state, the state's general government, said um, that the war was a war between brothers, no big no uncle. Okay. But what happened in Asaba wasn't there was no fighting going on in Asaba when the federal troops got there. No fighting whatsoever. Those that they killed were not soldiers. They just took them and lined them up and killed them. Even in the history books, in the military history books, there's no mention of it. It has got to be part of our history. Because if you don't have a history, you really cannot go ahead, go, go ahead in life and go ahead properly. It's got to be part of that. Nigeria is a mix of so many different people, different tribes, languages, religions, everything. I was born into this entity called Nigeria. I am proud, very, very proud to be a Nigerian. But so also, I am very proud to be female. I am very proud to be an Igbo woman. I am very, very proud to be an Asaba woman. This country belongs to all of us. Be holy. Nobody should be made to pay any, pri any, 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 pay any price that is way beyond that which is necessary to keep the country going. We paid more than a necessary price during the war. Oh, but again, don't you? Oh, you put it on no Biafra. Seems you know said 7th of october 2022 is our remembrance day for our fallen fathers mothers men women brothers sisters and children that were gruesomely murdered at asaba during the biafran genocidal war nigerians waged against biafrans we hereby declare friday the 7th of october 2022 a seat at home in Biafra land. As a law, Kia, Nigodu, Maki, Ah, if a tapa, you who you were, Macaramanga, I got by the room, Ponga and a body do, Ew, Ew, Ponga and a body do, Ew, Honor of Caribbean. Na, Papa? So einen schon mal gesehen? So einen? Von großer Reichweite zu Fortschritt, der alle mitnimmt. Let you know, power your world. Ist es wirklich notwendig, weniger zu essen, um schlank zu werden? Oder ist es sogar genau um... Slow motion disaster. Destruction, daring rescues, rising death toll. Very tough and resilient. Uh, of course, they didn't ask for this, uh, but, but they need our help now, and we're, we're going to be there for them. A statewide storm. A storm that, that, that's changed uh, the character uh, of a significant part of our state. Rising waters, raising questions, the toll, the costs, the insurance, shell shock to come. It's not all fraud. But the vast majority is fraud. The state rep who lofted all, Florida's first responders, the insurer sounding the alarm. 
Broward's mayor sending mutual aid, a special storm edition, all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. Michael is off. We are taking you to Fort Myers today where our local first responders are part of the teams still hoping to unearth people who survived in Hurricane Ian's remains. Ian stormed across the state and hardly any part of Florida was spared. Slamming winds and surging waters obliterated homes, roads, entire city infrastructure. Though that is just the beginning. Other crippling effects of Hurricane Ian will reveal in the months to come in the cost to build and ensure our homes and our properties. May we begin where the focus is still in Fort Myers, where rescues are still underway, as are recoveries. Trent Kelly right there on the ground. Trent, good morning. Looking around, it, there is nothing that... audio chat. What yeah. Oba of Lagos said that we are pushing them to the ocean. Most of these markets that are burning in Lagos, look at it, they are Igbo-dominated markets. Yeah. You get me? They, yeah. they, they, they are, they, in fact, some Yoruba were telling me when I was in Lagos last weekend that it is we, the Northerners, when we are in charge of Lagos as federal capital, that open room yeah. for Igbo to come and dominate them. And it's over yeah. now. And it's over. <laughs> All the businesses Igbo are doing, we are going to bring it and do it. <laughs> you get me? That's why you Buhari have to sign that Lagos is going to be given special status. Mm. We are going to have a kind of semi-regional system. Lagos is going to have special status. It means nobody again will control Lagos. The indigenous of Lagos are the ones that are going to control Lagos. They can form mm. land policies. Do you get me? Mm. They may decide yeah. to say you as a rubber man in Lagos, you'll pay five thousand naira for a land, as an mm. Me, as a house man, I will pay 10,000 naira. Even man will pay 1 million naira. <laughs> this is why they are heading for. <laughs> and I'm telling you, after four years, at least not we are liberal, but in the South we school, after four years, Igbo can never be use, useful, relevant again in the Southeast. Wait and see. Region. In fact, the plan is the plan of APC is that they are going to make alliance of northwest economic development. The west has the ocean. Can you hear me? Yes. The north has agricultural produce. Yes. So what they are going to do? They are, the government is going to develop all the agricultural and mineral resources in the north, and then they will put primary industries here. And then go yes. and export. The, finally, finish them in Lagos or Southwest, and export them, and bring back the money and share it between the two regions. Said 7th of October 2022 is our Remembrance Day for our fallen fathers, mothers, men, women, brothers, sisters, and children that were gruesomely murdered at Asaba. During the Biafran genocide war Nigerians waged against Biafrans, we hereby declare Friday, the 7th of October 2022, a seat at home in Biafra land. As the law kia nigo do na ki ah if ota kwa ihuri were makaramonga ina bani lo onga ina bani lo eu eu onga ina bani lo eu ono no karibio. Said 7th of October 2022 is our Remembrance Day for our fallen fathers, mothers, men, women, brothers, sisters, and children that were gruesomely murdered at Asaba. During the Biafran genocide war Nigerians waged against Biafrans, we hereby declare Friday, the 7th of October. 2022 is sit at home in Biafra land. As the law kia nigo do na ki ah if potakwa ehuri wore biafra seems you said 7th of october 2022 is our remembrance day for our fallen fathers mothers men women brothers sisters and children that were gruesomely murdered at asaba 
during the Biafran genocidal war Nigerians waged against Biafrans, we hereby declare Friday, the 7th of October, 2022, a seat at home in Biafra land. Aga lo kia ni godo na ki ah ifotakwa ihuri were makaramonga ni gba ni lo onga ni gba ni lo eu eu onga ni gba ni lo eu ono no karibio. I looked around and I saw machine guns being mounted all around us. Some of them were also carrying automatic rifles. There was silence. The nurses started shooting. And my father was lying not too far from me. His eyes were open up to a bed. The chain of events that led to the deaths at Asaba began years before. British colonialists created Nigeria by cobbling together many once independent territories, each with its own culture. In 1960, when it gained independence, Nigeria was home to over 200 different ethnic groups, the largest being the Hausa Fulani, the Yoruba, and the Igbo. Fears that one group would dominate led to ethnic tensions and corrupt elections which set the stage for the overthrow of civilian rule by a group of military officers in January 1966. Many northerners saw this as an Igbo power play. There had long been resentment against the Igbo, who had embraced Western education and become leaders in business and civil service across the country. Attacks on Igbo people erupted across northern and western Nigeria that May. A counter coup replaced the Igbo head of state with Colonel Yakubu Gowan in July, and the killings escalated into systematic massacres, which the Igbo called pogrom. Thousands of Igbo fled to their ancestral homes in the East and Midwest, including Asaba. By early 1967, the governor of the Eastern region, Colonel Emeka Ojuku, was arguing that Igbos were no longer safe in Nigeria. After political negotiations failed, he declared the sovereign state of Biafra on May 30th. Soon after, civil war broke out. Located on the west bank of the River Niger, Asaba was never part of Biafra, remaining part of the multi-ethnic Midwest region. It was a quiet town, its population now swollen by the arrival of refugees from the north and west. The war came to Asaba in August 1967, when Biafran troops crossed the Niger Bridge and invaded the Midwest. They quickly spread west, overrunning Benin City and coming within striking distance of Lagos. Federal forces quickly regained the initiative, retook Benin City in late September, and pushed the Biafrans back to Asaba. On October 5th, the retreating troops crossed back into Biafra, destroying the bridge as they left. Federal troops under Colonel Murtala Muhammad arrived late on October 5th, striking fear into the townspeople. 
Soldiers began going from house to house, rounding up men and boys suspected of Biafran sympathy. Somebody came looking for my brother-in-law and said that the federal troops had come into Asaba and they were burning houses. That it, and we opened the door and told them that no, no Biafran troop was there, that the house would be burned and it would be burned. Soldiers gathered people together and executions began. A man, a young man, maybe in his early, late 20s, early 30s, came with his wife. The wife just had a new baby. Then sitting where we were, the man with the baby, a soldier came to him and said, what did they do here? What did you do here? He didn't say anything. So he said, take that baby, give your wife, tell them, tell them bye-bye. I said, move. He got to say, moving. And as he was moving, he was starting to look at the soldier, you know, telling him to move, like, where do you want me to go? And the man pushed him at the back with the gun. Put him at the back with the gun. I said, move, move, me and my move. Say one Nigeria. So the guy put up his hand and said, one Nigeria. I would just say the crap. But I arrived at the shot. The wife didn't say a word. And I said, everybody, police station, that everybody should go to police station, apart from the old people, like my grandmother. So myself, my dad. I was walking behind him all the way. But then, just about two kilometers down the road from my house, I saw, I saw two corpses with their heads blown up. People with these white garment church people, you know, one of them with a the bell, the other one with a lantern, still burning at that time. So that was the first sign to we got that there was trouble, uh, you know, so that, that sent shivers you know, down our spine. And so we got to the police station and there was a huge crowd. You know? And then the police station will you know, come around, you know, Mr. X, Mr. B, you take us to his house, you'll be free. You know, they had names, they wanted to kill. Yeah. Once in a while, they pick somebody from the cloud, go to the back of the house, and they hear gunshots. My husband and the girl. And all those, about 400 people who were following them, they were shot at the police, in front of the police station. At that side of the police. I held them to the person I saw, the soldier. I saw that, I said, why did you kill my husband? I don't want to remember what happened. So why did, the man with the boat, uh, the boat of the gun hit me on the chest. If you, my, my, uh, woman, if you are not careful, you get killed as well. At that point, I went home. I got home to tell them that they had been killed. Papa, that's my father-in-law. When he heard that his two sons were killed, went out and before they before you go out to say what happened, they shot him. On October 6th, in an attempt to end the violence, leaders summoned all the townspeople to a peaceful march, pledging loyalty to Nigeria. On the morning of October 7th, thousands of men, women, and children from every quarter of Asaba joined the parade, singing and dancing. They came with the, the uh, normal Asaba way, with a gong, announcing that people, that the soldiers are already in Asaba, killing people. That if we can come to welcome them and declare peace with them, that we're with them, they will, will be spared. Started hearing, you know, dancing group. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. One Nigeria, one Nigeria, one Nigeria, one Nigeria. So along the line, you know, so let us go myself and my cousin. So as we are coming out, you know, towards the road, that time the group, the dancing group, you know, they were around the soldiers surrounded them, we were guiding them. That is Nigerian soldiers, we were carrying guns. But they lined up and said, women here, men here. And women who came with their sons, we are removing their skirts and blouse to disguise. So when I saw this scenario going on, and I felt, Something is wrong. If these women can disguise their children and my mother is not here, what do I do? And I looked at the whole place. There is no avenue for escape. They took us to a certain quarters and they, eventually the man who was a captain, he ordered them to start shooting us. Gunshots. People were falling. So when people fell, I fell with them. And they continued shooting and shooting and shooting. I lost count of time. I don't know how long. After some time, there was silence. And surprisingly, a lot of people stood up from, from all the bodies. 
and fled into the bush. I stood up also, but I saw a cousin of mine who was lying not too far from me. He was shot on the head. Um, my body was covered with blood, but I knew that I was safe. Nothing had happened. My cousin said we should wait till it was dark so that we could go together. And I agreed. You could hear the 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 sound of the injured crying. That evening, some women were able to retrieve the bodies of family members. Joseph Nwaje lost two brothers, aged 17 and 12. Mom in the evening was able to identify their corpses, took them in a wheelbarrow, pushed them to the family house. Where they were buried. Never saw their corpses. Never saw their body. But most were buried in mass graves with no opportunity for required ceremonies. Though I was so small, I could remember that what I saw were lifeless bodies. My dad was among those people that buried the dead. He left the house with shoulder, then this sent leave, protecting his nostril. That we enabled them to stand the, the stench there. It was after when they have decayed, you know, smelling all over the place, that the people there gathered and then dug a common grave and then started putting them there. There are so many, I cannot remember, so many, so many. Many townspeople ran into the bush or across to the east. But troops remained in Asaba, and the threat of rape hung over the remaining women and girls. They were forcibly married by soldiers. I have an auntie who was married forcibly by soldiers. Children were raped, and also even old women were raped too. Yeah. And even when they see that you're a young girl, they will falsely take you as their wife. That is, if you don't want to. As people trickled back, they found the once thriving town deserted, houses burned and everything of value stolen. We have no home to enter, no house to enter. Our house was burnt down. Everything. In fact, where we went, we had to be tying, you know, the bags they put, they put rice and beans. That's what we tied because there was no clothes. There was nothing for us to, to hide our nakedness. A lot of children were shocked. Oh, you know, people were dying just like that. Some we ate rats. In fact, I suffered. Exactly how many died on October 7th is not clear. Between 500 and 800 seems likely, in addition to hundreds killed in previous days. Many families were decimated. My immediate elder brother, this one following him, and one of my cousins, three of them were killed. You need to know who my husband was. Harmless, no, couldn't harm, couldn't harm anybody. He liked life, he liked himself, he, liked, he was a, a lovely man. And he just 
Most him off like that. Was my favorite brother, and he was outstanding as a as a student. He was captain of cricket, captain of soccer. He was a sprinter. He was a sprinter, and he was in the Nigerian four by hundred and ten meter hundred meters relay team. So it was a a great loss, you know, um, to the family. Um, of course, one tries to forgive. Leo Samuel Isiche was a teacher, a darling father. He, you know, we looked up to him so much. He was everything to us, and he wanted to bring his children up to make sure that they had education. I want people to know because not many people know what happened. Even my own children, because God knows why I had to survive for me to have a story to tell and that's what i'm telling you now for decades the massacres at asaba remained almost unknown outside the community in 1967 the nigerian press was tightly controlled and few foreign news reporters were on the ground in the words of nobel laureate wole shoyinka the midwest ebos had become the most vulnerable nigerians the war itself became internationally famous in 1968 after the federal government imposed a blockade, starving Biafra into submission in 1970. The silence began to lift in the mid-1990s, and some survivors testified to the 2001 Nigerian Human Rights Violations Investigation Commission, known as the Okuda Panel, which set the stage for more people to speak. It was for us the first opportunity uh, that we're going to have to even air the matter. But the, uh, the aim was really to begin something by way of a healing process. If you wrong somebody and the person has an opportunity to, to talk about it, and uh, assuming you, you show an act, you show some contrition, uh, you apologize, or you go some way into alleviating their, their pain and suffering, then the healing process can begin. Four decades after the war, Asaba is a busy state capital looking to the future. Yet the scars remain. These are visible in the derelict buildings that remain unrestored and on the bodies of those who survived. And they are invisible, borne by Asabans who have kept the memory of the cruel deaths of their fathers, brothers, and uncles. The people of Asaba do not want retribution only to tell their story, allowing the massacres to become part of Nigerian collective memory. After the war, the then head of state, the state's general government said um, that the war was a war between brothers, no victim of vanquished. Okay. But what happened in Asaba wasn't clear. There was no fighting going on in Asaba when the federal troops got there. No fighting whatsoever. Those that they killed were not soldiers. They just took them and lined them up and killed them. Even in the history books, in the military history books, there's no mention of it. It has got to be part of our history. Because if you don't have a history, you cannot go ahead, go, go ahead in life and go ahead properly. It's got to be part of our history. Nigeria is a mix of so many different people, different tribes, languages, religions, everything. I was born into this entity called Nigeria. I am proud, very, very proud, to be a Nigerian. But so also, I am very proud to be female. I am very proud to be an Igbo woman. I'm very, very proud to be an Asaba woman. This country belongs to all of us. E holy. Nobody should be made to pay any price any 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 pay any price that is way beyond that which is necessary to keep the country going. We paid more than a necessary price during the war. Thank you. 
Oh, but again, don't you? Oh, you put it on no Biafra. Seems you know said 7th of october 2022 is our remembrance day for our fallen fathers mothers men women brothers sisters and children that were gruesomely murdered at asaba during the biafran genocidal war nigerians waged against biafrans we hereby declare friday the 7th of october 2022 a seat at home in Biafra land. I got lock here, Nigo do, my key. Ah, if a taqua, if you were a Macaramon, I got body low, long I and a body low, eh, long I and a body low, eh, honor. There is a motto which has been borne by many of my ancestors a noble motto I serve. Those words were an inspiration to many bygone heirs to the throne when they made their nightly dedication as they came to manhood. I cannot quite do as they did, but through the inventions of science, I can do what was not possible for any of them. I can make my solemn act of dedication with a whole empire listening. I should like to make that dedication now. It is very simple. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. From the young Elizabeth, it was quite some promise, a promise she would keep. Leaving her home on what must surely be the greatest day of her life, Queen Elizabeth drives to her coronation. Through decades of incessant change, she was to be a constant. Preceded by her guards and escorted by her cavalry, she drives through cheering crowds down the gaily decorated avenue of the Mall. Steadfast, ever-present, reassuring, a queen whose devotion would earn the respect of the world. Madam, is your majesty willing to take the oath? I am willing. A much-loved woman, a remarkable reign, the monarch of our times. The climax of the ceremony has arrived when the archbishop gently sets this splendid emblem on the queen's head. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born into the most extraordinary life. Her early life was the life of a relatively normal family, a family that wanted to be away from the prying eyes of the cameras. Princess Elizabeth's father was the shy, unassuming Duke of York. Duke and Duchess of York, her parents didn't have to do very much in those days, not nearly as much as members of the royal family do these days. They were a close and loving family. Princess Elizabeth and her sister Margaret would have spent much of their childhood in Scotland. I think Scotland from that age onwards was always the fun place where you could go a bit wild, you know. I mean, we played a game called Catching Happy Days which involved roaring around the garden at great speed, catching the leaves as they fell off the trees. Um, that kept us happy all day. You can't imagine children with iPads and every sort of funny game. 
being content to that sort of thing. Uh, I think of the two young princesses. Princess Elizabeth was always a serious-minded one. She had a one. Sense of his regard of her little sister. They were quite often with their parents, more so perhaps than other children of the same class. Um, but of course, it was very different in those days. In all these processions and in the groups on the balconies, the public caught charming glimpses of the young princess who was third in line of succession to the throne. I think she realized that she had a a public side as well as a private side, even at quite a young age, really. That was the way you behaved. It, I don't think she thought of herself as tremendously different to other children, but on the other hand, there were certain restrictions that uh, she would have accepted as necessary. Both the parents always brought the two children up um, with the idea of duty and... and um, selflessness, really. The line of succession was never supposed to pass through her father. He was the king's younger brother and second in line to the throne. Well, Britain had found herself faced by a constitutional dilemma, unprecedented even in her long and eventful history. Within months of his coronation, Princess Elizabeth's uncle, Edward VIII, was faced with a choice between marrying the woman he loved or remaining as king. I have found it impossible. Thank you for watching that video. We appreciate and this is where I will be leaving you guys. But if this is your first time on this great channel, please do it to subscribe and put on your notification bell so that whenever we upload any video for this great channel you will be the first person to see the video so guys see you guys some other time